Hello, thank you for having me. I'd like to really thank the three organizing institutions who have made it possible for me to be here today, Kunstner House, the National Museum and the Contemporary Art Museum, and everybody who I've met in the last few days that I've been here has been, um, I've had a wonderful experience in Norway in the last few days and in Oslo getting to know um, something of your community and your various organizations and how you function. And it's really been inspirational and um, has made me think a lot about what I do. So I appreciate that. I also very much appreciate you're putting up with my English. Thank you for that. Um, but I am American. <laughs> and I'm not voting for Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> and I will not talk about that anymore. <laughs> um, what's really interesting about the two exhibitions in the last couple of days, and I was thinking about it this morning, um, when I was actually at the Astrop Farney Museum, and the difference, I was thinking about the ways in which um, these two exhibitions for me, as a curator coming from a different country and um, learning about a whole new history in some way, but a history that is very much and clearly tied to a history that I do know, is um, one of the most important things that I think we can offer each other <laughs> in the world as we think about how we interact globally and locally. And I think that these two exhibitions in particular um, really capture the potential of what that means or what those two things mean and how can they can function together. So um, I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, I titled my talk Revising Revisionism um, because I am the curator of the Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. And for me, that title um, brings an enormous amount of history, an enormous amount of... Um, conversation about what that even means. It's an ongoing conversation as far as I'm concerned. What is the value and the long-term possibilities and importance and significance of being a curator for feminist art? What does that mean? Um, and for me, what that means is, um, to some degree, pushing on not only the canon, as we'll talk about, that canon of modernism that we all, I think, feel the need to push on, um, but also, in some ways, pushing on the revisionism that I am, or my position is the legacy of, and that is second wave feminism. So that's what I'll talk about a little bit today. Um, so I think that we've reached that point where um, people like Judy Chicago um, and her dinner party, which is housed in the Brooklyn Museum and has been housed in the Sackler Center permanently for the last um, nine years, and will continue on view there indefinitely, you know, starts a conversation in 1978 about the very straightforward idea of reintroducing women to the party <laughs> um, that they were excluded from. Um, and from that moment, that instigating moment of second wave feminism and the, and the very, again, straightforward idea of what revisionism, what revising history means by introducing in this case, literally 1,038 new names or not new names um, back into a conversation um, about history is a jumping off point that's very significant. What's also significant is that the Sackler Center for Feminist Art, which was um, founded by Elizabeth Sackler and the former director of the Brooklyn Museum, Arnold Lehman, in 2007, um, is that the Sackler Center is housed in the Brooklyn Museum. And that, to me, is a vitally important thing. If Elizabeth Sackler and Judy Chicago had decided to build their own women's museum to house the dinner party, I think I would be a lot less interested in being the curator. I think that part of what the most important conversation for me is, is the fact that because the dinner party, which I just showed you, is in this place, it changes everything about this place. And so my job becomes um, not, as I like to say, um, my job is not to have some magic wand where I designate something feminist or not feminist. It is not my job to convince anybody to be a feminist or not. I mean, I hope that you are, but it's not my position that I have to come up with the words to attach to the word feminist to make people feel comfortable with it. What I think my job is, is to point to the fact that if you're alive in 2016 and you're looking at visual culture, you've been impacted by feminism. The way you look at objects has been impacted by one of the most significant art movements of the 20th century. And what does that mean? Um, so as a result, I feel that my job is to look at any object um, and talk about it in relationship to readings that pertain to feminism, the cultural um, imperatives of gender equity, 
um, the shifting nature of gender in our culture and what that means in our cultures. Um, so again, the fact that we are housed in the Brooklyn Museum, which is one of those historical models of the 19th century that somehow believed that um, a group of people came together and believed that they could bring the world into this place, um, it's a unique opportunity to talk about exactly what that means in any number of ways. I'll just say this um, installation shot here is from a, um, uh, uh, a project we did in 2013 with Suzanne Lacey, um, a project called Between the Door and the Street. And this is, um, uh, if you've been to the Brooklyn Museum, you'll, this is a, a sort of um, plaza where people can sit. Um, uh, this actually, this, this, this plaza reflects the original steps when the museum was built in the late 19th century, it was built on this, by the same architects and on the same model as the Metropolitan Museum. So it had an even bigger staircase leading up to the main floor of the institution. In the 1930s, those staircases were taken down in one of the first director's attempts to make more popular and more available and more inviting the institution to the local community. It was believed by that director that those steps were intimidating and the simple psychological fact of taking them down and opening up the door on the streets would be um, one way of inviting in the local communities to this sort of imposing institution on Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn. Um, when we made a, res a renovation several years ago, we added these steps back as this sort of reflection of that history. Um, I want to talk about... Uh, you know, jumping from Judy Chicago and thinking about this idea of reintroducing women into history, what I've been thinking about, I'm going to talk about three exhibitions briefly, and um, what I've been thinking about since I've been here is that they really reflect, and this idea of revisioning history really reflects voices, really reflects voices that have not been included in a conversation or have not been allowed to speak for themselves oftentimes. And so I was thinking this morning that interestingly, I think all of the exhibitions that I'm going to talk about have some reflect in some way on that idea of voices. And I'm not really going to talk very much about this particular installation except to say that it, it sort of starts that conversation and it speaks to the mission of the Sackler Center and it also brings up one revisionist way of dealing with the history of voices and the way women's voices in particular are heard. This is a project by an artist named Matthew Buckingham. Um, it is a project he did called The Spirit and the Letter. It was installed at the Sackler Center in 2012. And the reason I bring it up is because um, Matthew, who's this very thoughtful uh, researcher and historian and, and visual artist, um, became very interested in the idea of Mary Wollstonecraft's voice. As some of you may know, Mary Wollstonecraft is a person, a biography, a famous story in the history of the Enlightenment that was um, truly damaged by a biography that was published by her husband after her death. Um, her, after she, she died several days after giving birth to Mary Shelley. She was a revolutionary thinker, an early feminist, a writer, um, a political activist, and a, um, really a revolutionary, and um, on many levels, social as well as political. And in one of those ways in which she was a revolutionary was in her own personal agency, um, as a sexual being. And um, after she died, her husband, in an attempt to um, show her importance, wrote a biography that reflected this very ex uh, non-traditional life that she lived. And as a result, people were shocked and um, squelched her history to a large degree. So Matthew Buckingham became interested in this, this sort of biographical narrative, and what he decided to do was to make a piece by which he, again as a male artist, um, went back and made a work that reflects only the words that Mary Wollstonecraft published in her lifetime. So only the words that she chose to make available to the public, um, which is a very important gesture, I think, when it comes to biography and the way women's lives are written. Um, these are the words that Mary Wollstonecraft chose to represent herself with. And as an act of um, reclaiming that position, her position, he made a piece in which he wrote a libretto, and the figure that you see here on the ceiling is an actress who um, walks in and out of the, the scene on the ceiling and on the floor and, um, and speaks the words that um, Matthew sort of gathered from Mary Wollstonecraft's various writings. So that's an example of um, a simple, I mean not simple, but a, a kind of elegant actually gesture towards how one can think about um, bringing, allowing voices to speak for themselves. Another 
very different um, voice that I'm interested in um, having speak for itself or herself is an artist um, named Judith Scott. Uh, uh, last year, uh, Matthew Higgs and I, Matthew is the chief curator and um, director of White Columns, a nonprofit space in New York. And um, he and I worked on a show called Judas Scott Bound and Unbound. The show actually opens next week in Aspen, Colorado, if any of you happen to be there. Um, and this is an installation shot, <coughs> excuse me, of the um, exhibition. So, Judas Scott is an artist who is exceptional as all artists are, but Judith Scott is exceptional in a number of ways. Um, Judith Scott made remarkable sculptural objects. She made objects that were, um, <laughs> oh, you read my mind. Um, I hope that's for me. Yeah, yeah. Thank, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, I can talk about Judith Scott for a long time, so I'm gonna try and make this brief. Judith Scott is an artist that I met, introduced, did not meet, she died in 2005, whose work I was introduced to at an art fair in Miami. Um, White Columns had her work in its booth. Um, I fell in love with these objects that to me spoke very clearly to contemporary art making, to a ways in which numbers of contemporary artists and young artists in particular are interested in um, sculpture as a material using sort of found objects, detritus, um, uh, yarn and other sort of non-traditional materials um, and that spoke to me as amazing formal objects um, and I became interested in her work and um, one of the things that interests me about any work oftentimes that's made from non-traditional objects particularly um, thread or um, weaving is that it that is a medium that I also believe has been largely reintroduced or introduced into exhibitions and places like the Brooklyn Museum because of feminism. Feminism allows us to understand non-traditional materials as of equal value to um, to painting or sculpture. I think this is pretty simple at this point and most of us would not even think twice about that. Um, but I think that that is the legacy, one of the legacies of second wave feminism. So Judith Scott was an artist who has an exceptional biography. Again, the biography. Um, and it's a biography that's problematic because part of me doesn't want to tell it. As a curator, I want you to look at the objects and I don't want to tell you about Judith Scott's life. Um, but I have to tell you about Judith Scott's life because it is part of who she is as an artist. Um, and Judith Scott was an artist who was born in the 1940s in Ohio. She is an artist who was born with Down syndrome. She was a twin. She was um, largely deaf and mute. She was institutionalized for 35 years in Ohio in um, a system that allowed her no access to any form of education whatsoever. Um, she is an artist who, um, whose sister um, gained guardianship of her when she was in her 40s and brought her to the west coast of California where she was introduced to a studio system, a unique studio system for artists with disabilities. A studio system set up by a couple in the 1970s as a system where artists with disabilities, particularly um, cognitive and developmental disabilities, could come and make art. It is not a therapeutic program. It is a program where artists help artists make art. Judith came to Creative Growth. She sat at a table at Creative Growth um, for two years doing nothing, and one day was introduced to fibers. And when she was introduced to fibers, the first thing she ever made after sitting at a desk for two years and not really doing anything was this remarkable bundled object. It is an object that has paint on it because she was being encouraged to paint at this point. It's the only object she ever made with paint on it. Um, it is a moment in an artist's life of an awakening that continued unabated for the next 15 years. Judith Scott became an artist who had a daily routine where she arrived at Creative Growth, she sat at her desk, or her table, it was a folding table, and worked for 15 years. She would make objects, she would stop when she was finished making an object, she had a sign that she was finished, and the work would be taken away, and she would immediately start on the next one, some of them taking months. Um, so she was an artist who worked within an art studio system. She had a very clear impression of when a work was finished and what it was supposed to look like. She incorporates into these objects um, many found objects, so you don't know what's inside of them. Um, but she was famous for pilfering things. She often like pilfered people's wedding rings and paychecks. Um, 
but she gathered materials and she worked with them obsessively and she made these extraordinary objects. This piece is particularly wonderful. It, it, actually, we acquired it at the museum from the exhibition. This is an object that um, they were apparently doing um, renovation at Creative Growth and all the artists were housed separately while they did the renovation, but Judith, wouldn't, Judith Scott would not leave creative growth, so they set up a place for her to work while um, the renovation was going on. And apparently she ran out of her materials and there was nobody there to help her, so she went around to all the kitchens and bathrooms and took all the paper toweling that she could find and wet it and knotted it and made this piece. Um, we actually x-rayed it, because people are always asking us if they're x-rayed, after we acquired it. And inside of it is one of those um, electric heating elements from a stove. The sculpture, that's a good question. It's, um, all of Judith Scott's sculptures are huggable. That's the way I think of them because she worked at a desk and they're physical and she moved them herself. Very rarely later in her career she became a little bit more Baroque and the pieces got bigger but largely they were the size that she could move. So, um, and as a curator this is so complicated and so important, right, on so many levels. Um, the other thing that, you know, Judith Scott left us her objects. Whether she meant them for us, we don't know. She meant them for herself, we know that. Um, whether she was communicating with us, I'm not convinced she was. Um, though she did apparently, at the end of her life, become very aware that she was kind of a hot ticket. So she dressed a lot more. Um, but we don't know anything about these objects except what they give us visually. And this dramatic story that I've just told you that I fought with myself out about with Matthew and I and Tom DiMaria from Creative Growth had so many conversations about how do you, why do you tell this story? People want the biography, but we want to talk about the stuff. So this is the exact opposite of somebody like Mary Wollstonecraft, right? This is the exact opposite of that great feminist adage. The other thing that I think feminism does is it reintroduces this idea of the personal as political. Feminism made it okay to introduce narrative biographical information back into artwork in that post-minimalist moment when formalism dictated that nobody could speak about anything personal. Um, but in a case like Judith Scott, how much is too much? Um, the other fascinating thing about Judith Scott's work is she worked, as I said, progressively on each piece, and when she was done, she was done. There's no indicator from her about anything about this work. We don't know what side is up, what side is down. You know, as a curator, imagine what it's like to be confronted with a body of work where you don't even, like, know which side is up. And there's not an artist to ask. This is not somebody who was interviewed by Art Forum and sort of gave the whole story about the way that they wanted to have things shown. She didn't care. So Matthew and I decided that we would um, install the work as closely as possible, um, in some ways reflective of, probably not as closely as possible, to the table on which she worked. And to put the pieces on the table, on these platforms, reflecting the ways in which she worked on them. Some of them clearly have bases. Um, and that's what we did. Um, and it was a remarkable experience to have this conversation because basically as a curator what you end up doing is having a conversation about all of these questions that I'm raising. You know, where your comfort level is when you're talking about a person with disability about speaking for them. And where do you um, get involved with making decisions about the work. Um, this is a piece, for instance, that was um, shown on a wall oftentimes, but Judith Scott never made anything on a wall, so we decided not to show it on a wall, even though it looks beautiful on a wall. Um, this is an installation shot of some of the objects. The other thing you may no notice that I'm struggling with, which is very interesting, is, you know, um, nobody walks into an exhibition of, nobody would start a conversation in an exhibition of Willem de Kooning by saying, um, Bill, the alcoholic, you know, philanderer. Um, but you walk into an exhibition like this, and what people do is they say Judith, and they say disability. And that to me is a very important point. And it's also very important to me because I feel like it's something that happens to women a lot. It's interesting how women often get called by their first names um, in situations where men are often called by their last names. So you could see me probably struggling here. I'm constantly doing it myself, partially because I feel like I know her at some point this way, but not Judith, but Judith Scott or Scott, the way that you would refer to a male artist. And the small things like that that I think sound kind of... Um, 
maybe like you're being too picky or something, but I think it's really significant. And I think it's really significant in a place like the Brooklyn Museum. This piece is extraordinary and shows you exactly how in command of color <laughs> Judith Scott was in what she did and that everything she did was completely um, clear to her. Uh, you can see this last, just a couple more shots and I've probably already spoken more than I need to. Um, five minutes for my whole talk. Oh boy, okay. Um, <laughs> this is what happens when I talk about Judith Scott. I'm sorry, I'll stop. Uh, I'll just show you a couple more pieces. This is an extraordinary one. You can see where she took um, tubing, like medical tubing and incorporated into the work and a real to real um, piece there. Here we have a, um, even Judith Scott couldn't enc encase an entire shopping cart but she tried. This last photograph is a photograph that was taken just before she died by a wonderful photographer named Ann Collier, who some of you may know, an extraordinary photographer. Um, okay, I have five minutes? Okay. So I'm gonna really just talk about this exhibition for two minutes and then I'm gonna talk about the third exhibition that I'm working on now. This is an exhibition that I did um, with Vincent Bonan, uh, an independent curator in Montreal in 2013. It is a project that very closely aligns with the conceptual art project um, that we have here at the Contemporary Art Museum. This is a project um, based on a book by the critic Lucy Lepard, who I'm sure many of you know and love as much as I do. This is a very um, influential book that she wrote um, in 1973. It's called Six Years, um, and this is the full title. Six Years, the Dematerialization of the Art Object from 1966 to 1972, a cross-reference book of information on some aesthetic boundaries consisting of a bibliography into which are inserted a fragmented text, artworks, documents, interviews, and symposia arranged chronologically and focused on so-called conceptual or information or idea art with mentions of such vaguely designated areas as minimal, anti-form systems, earth or process art occurring now in the Americas, Europe, England, Australia, and Asia with political, with occasional political overtones. So. <laughs> this is a book I love. This is a book that many of us grew up with and is a primer for conceptual art that comes from a different perspective than a lot of um, understanding of conceptual art does. It is a book that has, that is encapsulate Lucy Lepard's approach to criticism. And one of the most important things she ever did was she called this book the best show she ever curated. And as a curator, you hear somebody like Lucy Lepard say that and the first, ch it's a challenge. Um, so we did an exhibition based on this book and it was um, a wonderful opportunity and I will not go into all of the work, obviously. Um, this is a great piece by John Latham that is in the collection of MoMA that involves inviting people to chew the pages of art and culture, Clement Greenberg's definitive book, and spit it back out and make beer out of it. Um, very important work. And very funny. And in 1966 really encapsulated a lot of the thinking about conceptual art, wanting to push back against Greenberg, um, wanting to introduce um, humor, wanting to not be too serious in spite of the title of the book. And um, so it's a very extraordinary early piece. Um, quickly, I'll run through some slides. This is the installation shot. On the big screen, we have this wonderful early 1966 video by Bruce Nauman called Fishing for Asian Carp, which takes on a particular re resonance in 2013 and later because Asian carp is an invasive species in the United States. At the time, that was not the intention of the work, but it certainly becomes part of the subtext when you're talking about it now. Um, Eccentric Abstraction was the first show that Lucy ever curated, a very important show, and she called it the most important piece of criticism she ever wrote. An installation shot of that show. Um, two minutes, right? Okay, so I'm going to skip most of this work. I wish I could tell you about this particular piece, which has to do with a very important early conceptual artwork in Latin America of locking people into a gallery and not letting them know that they're locked in and forcing them to break the glass to get out. This is also one of my favorite pieces in the show, a lovely series of postcards by Ankawara to Lucy Lepard. Um, a great card from her, one of her number shows. This is the card for Richard Archwager's blip piece. The blip is a sign that actually comes from Morse code, which he was taught during World War II while he was stationed here in Europe. Um, skipping, I'm skipping. The epilogue 
is to the exhibition was the final number show that Lucy Lepard did, which was her first exhibition of women artists. During the years she was working with conceptual art, she kept being told that there were no conceptual women artists. There were, in fact, lots of conceptual women artists. They were appearing from the very beginning of this book, but somehow people didn't notice that. Um, so her first project that was devoted exclusively to women was an exhibition called Circa 7500, which took place in California and documents um, women conceptual artists. This is an incredible piece by Marilee Eucalese um, in which she... Um, became very involved in the idea of what it means to maintain oneself for women, in particular this idea of maintenance and the way that maintenance gets in the way of everything or becomes subsumed in everything became very important to her. So she did what she calls maintenance art. You can see her cleaning the streets of Soho here. She went on to do a project based on this notion um, of who's gonna clean up the morning after the revolution. Um, and in New York, she decided that meant the sanitation workers, the thousands of sanitation workers who take care of New York City. She made it her project over the next decade to personally thank and shake hands with every single sanitation worker in the city and is a project that she continues to elaborate on. It is incredible. This is a picture of Lucy speaking at the Brooklyn Museum about the relevance of museums in 1971. This was also a very important moment in the Brooklyn Museum history because part of this event encapsulated a conversation around something like, is it possible to have childcare in a museum so that women can come and look at art? I'll close by just really quick, quickly mentioning this exhibition called We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, 1965 to 1985. This is an exhibition that I'm working on right now with my co-curator, Rujeko Hulkley, who's the assistant curator of contemporary art at the museum. And this is a revisionist history of second wave feminism. This is an exhibition that is intended to take up the very complicated history that second wave feminism in the United States and I think in Europe has in relationship to women of color and the ways in which women of color in particular didn't feel that second wave feminism, white stream feminism as it's often called, um, invited them and included them and addressed their needs and their life experience. And this is an exhibition that hasn't been done and it certainly hasn't been done in a place like the Sackler Center which very much grows from the emergence of second wave feminism. So I'm very excited about this exhibition and I'll just quickly scroll through and show you some of the pieces. This is a great Adrian Piper performance, Cruising White Women. This is work by a collective um, called Where We At, um, a collective of women who came together um, to support each other as artists. They were part of the Black Power movement. They did not call themselves feminists, but they were clearly involved in thinking about how women can support themselves. And this is a group shot of Where We At. This is one of the posters from one of their shows called Cookin' and Smokin'. Uh, the show will include Betty Saar, a very important um, West Coast American artist. This is one of her early important pieces using Aunt Jemima. Um, we'll also be using um, examples from Heresies, the Heresies Collective, and several of the important um, publications they did. One on third world women, one called Racism is the Issue, and then a third on lesbian identification. Uh, we also will have Faith Ringgold. Uh, Lorraine O'Grady, this is a very important performance of Lorraine O'Grady's Mademoiselle Bourgeoisie Noir that she did at uh, an important gallery called Just Above Midtown. These are two slides of the um, performance and on the lower right here, if you recognize that's um, a very, one of the most important I think artists of the 20th century, um, David Hammonds. And these are pictures of um, the Art Workers Coalition, which Lucy Lepard was a part of, protesting in front of the Whitney about the inclusion of women of color um, into the Whitney. And that's actually a picture of Lucy at the same protest. So it sort of all ties in together, these communities. And then finally, Howardina Pindell, uh, uh, an exhibition called Free White, an installation called Free White and 21 that was part of an exhibition called The Dialectics of Isolation that was organized by Anna Mendieta. Very important exhibition. Um, finally, a great image of an artist named Senga Nangudi with a piece that she made of a tire with hanging nylons. This piece is actually in the Brooklyn Museum collection. A performance work by Senga and Marin Hassinger. Important piece um, called Facial Cosmetic Variations by Anna Mangietta. And finally, a joyful performance that involves um, uh, Marin Hassinger, another important artist in the exhibition. And man, did I just not tell you very much about this. <laughs> when is it opening? That's a good question. <laughs> Book your tickets. It's the 10th anniversary of the Sackler Center, and this is only one exhibition 
that will be involved. So, okay, now I'm stopping. <laughs>